Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. My name is Gustavo Giordani. I'm speaking from Brazil, from Sao Paulo. I'm here in my office, so it's a, it's a pleasure to join you for uh, 50 minutes, one hour, talking about a little bit uh, about, about what we are doing in, uh, in Brazil, what we are doing in Sao Paulo, and what we are doing with uh, many good dentists uh, around the world, uh, what we are trying to achieve with uh, implant in aesthetic zone. Uh, today I'm going to share one clinical case with you. It's a case that I did uh, in Romania with a very good friend, Florin Kofar. And this particular case, uh, it's very interesting because uh, we tried to develop a protocol uh, combining everything we had from the literature, uh, from the analog protocol. And uh, we tried to combine everything we learned from our great masters like Eric Van Doren, Victor Clavijo, Galip Grell, and uh, we put in our uh, daily practice uh, trying to combine the digital workflow with all the biological concepts. So uh, today we are more focused trying to work as much as we can with the digital tools and also the digital planning. So we are trying to execute more and more the guided surgeries so we can make a predictable case and also trying to combine as much as we can the minimal invasive approach. So um, I'm going to share with you uh, one clinical case step by step so we can understand every step so we can understand why it's so important uh, all the steps to achieve a very good result, result one when we extract the tooth and we place an immediate implant. And how can we uh, use the digital uh, concepts uh, to combine uh, copying nature uh, with the natural root of the patient? So we are trying now as much as we can to copy the nature by using the natural format and the natural root of the patient to create the perfect emergence profile, to create a minimal invasive approach, and to try to create a protocol so we can uh, touch less uh, in the patient, try to unscrew less and less. With this, we are uh, achieving very good results in aesthetic zone. So, of course, everything I'm going to talk, it's based on the literature. Everything that I'm going to talk today is based on scientific evidence. Nothing that I'm going to talk here, uh, it's from my head or Florin's head or we create something. It's everything based on the literature. Uh, but I'm going to not focus only in scientific evidence. I'm going to focus also in our clinical experience. The techniques that we like to use the techniques that we are using in our daily practice and uh, understanding how easy it is so we can create predictable techniques with easy results and also techniques that are replicable you can use uh, every day in your practice and uh, it works very well and i'm gonna focus a lot in the transition zone because uh, the wide aesthetics the uh, tooth, the shape of the tooth, the morphology of the tooth, it's uh, beauty. So beauty in our concept is uh, subjective. So uh, I'm going to show one uh, result for you and maybe for you this result is not good, it's not uh, beautiful. But uh, the white aesthetic, the tooth in cells, in our opinion, is just a conversation with you, uh, what you like and what your patient is expecting. But the pink aesthetics and the combination between this white aesthetics and the pink aesthetics, the transition zone, this is very important. And this is our responsibility. It's very important to have a very good transition zone and a very healthy transition zone so we can have a very uh, good and a long-term and stable restoration uh, for our patient when we are talking about uh, uh, one uh, 
single uh, restoration on top of an implant. So I have one question to start this presentation. So do you have patients like this in your office? Do you have these kind of situations in your office? Patients that uh, are referred for us, patients that comes from a different dentist or patients that we treat in the past and now after two, three, four years, just start to come to our, our office with some problems like uh, recessions, we start to see dark uh, substract uh, uh, showing uh, through the gingiva because the power of a very good implant in aesthetic zone and a very nice restoration is the same power to change the life of a patient in a very bad way. We have many steps, we have many rules to follow and now we are now understanding these uh, rules to avoid these kind of situations, to avoid this uh, dark, uh, dark uh, substrate on top uh, uh, showing through the gingiva, to try to uh, avoid recessions, trying to avoid losing papillas because at the past, uh, the concepts were different. We were discussing, I don't know, maybe two or three years ago, if we should fill the gap or not. Uh, which kind of implant should we use, a wide platform or narrow platform? So it's changing now from time to time, but now the literature is very solid. And we know how to avoid this kind of situation so we don't end up with problems like this. So I'm going to focus now in these uh, minutes or 45 minutes that I have to show to you how can we combine the scientific evidence with uh, our clinical experience and have a very predictable result avoiding these kind of situations. And I'm going to explain to you nine steps to work with predictability in uh, immediate implants. So when your patient comes to your office and you need to extract one uh, single central, how can you work with predictability? And I'm gonna show this case to you. This is our model for today. This is Monica. And Monica uh, came to Timishora uh, to do um, uh, aesthetic rehabilitation. She came to Florin, she came to Dentkov to do uh, rehabilitation to have a better smile and when this patient came to us we start to do our digital clone what is the digital clone the digital clone is just taking pictures taking videos taking all the complementary exams to understand uh, what we have from the patients and to try to create a treatment plan and when we saw the Monica's exams, we start to understand that we had to replace one single uh, central. And we need to have the tools and the um, knowledge to replace one single central with a very good predictability. So those are the nine steps that I consider very important when you extract a single central and place an immediate implant until the final restoration. So we start in the case selections and we need to have also a perfect uh, 3D position of the implant. We need to take care of the tissue. We need to do the tissue reconstruction and also the provisionals are very important. And then we finish with the final restoration. So let's go through the nine steps now so we can understand why those steps, uh, those, um, steps are very important so when we started monica's case as i said uh, we did all the the exams we took the pictures of the face we did the videos so we could discuss with the team so as i said we did all the the, the pictures the videos everything uh was okay for our rehabilitation but when we start to check uh clinically Monica's case, we saw many problems in one single central. We saw mobility of the, uh, the tooth number 11. 
we saw infection, we saw superation with mobility, so the tooth was not okay. When he did the scan, when he went to the tomography, we saw a very short tooth and also uh, with an internal root resorption. So when we have this kind of situation, superation, infection, mobility, internal root resorption, and we're going to restore this tooth, uh, we understand that this tooth is uh, uh, extraction indication. So let's go now through the nine steps because uh, in the middle of uh, one rehabilitation, we're going to need to extract one tooth, place one implant, and we need to understand if you have this indication and also all the steps to have predictability in the final results. So first of all, we need to understand the case, uh, the indication. We need to have our perfect case selection. So to extract the tooth and to place an immediate implant, we always check two points. The first one is the residual bone. I need to have bone in the apical and in the palatal direction to place the implant in the correct 3D position. I don't look now the buccal wall because the buccal wall now is not important to place the implant in the correct position and to have a very good primary stability. The buccal wall now, uh, we're going to look a little bit after because this will be important for the aesthetics. I check now the palatal bone and also the apical bone. And if I check in the tomography and I have bone enough to place the implant in the correct 3D position, this is just the first point. This is just the first uh, uh, important uh, step in the case selection. Then I'm going to look to the soft tissue. So now if I have bone enough, I need to check the soft tissue and I cannot have a recession with more than 3 millimeters of the tooth that I'm going to extract compared with the adjacent tooth. Because if I have a recession with more than three to four millimeters, I will have an aesthetic risk. So if I have a recession of more than three millimeters to four millimeters, I prefer to go for the extraction, socket preservation with bone uh, filling with the biomaterial and a connective tissue graft. So I'm going to have a better situation after four to six months and then I place a link implant. So if I have a situation like Monica's case, I have bone enough to place the implant in the correct position. I have soft tissue in the correct position with a recession or a gingival margin, coronary compared with the adjacent tooth. I have the perfect indication for the immediate implant. If I go again to the literature, I can find some contraindications in Monica's case. Because if I see the literature in many different groups that, uh, that I follow in the literature, I can see many different uh, contraindications and indications. So if I see, if I check the literature, I'm going to see some papers showing that if I have a buccal bone fenestration, I can have a contraindication of immediate implant thin tissue phenotype or infection. But also, if I go through the literature, I'm going to see that those are not contraindications, but attention points for a technique selection. I mean, with a GBR, with a biomaterial, and maybe some uh, uh, the use of membranes, I can uh, treat the problem of a buccal bone fenestration and solve the problem in the long term. Always, we're going to use a connective tissue graft in order to create a thick tissue and to create instability of my case. So if I have a very thin tissue, as Monica uh, has uh, or had, I will treat this with a connective tissue graft and we're going to increase the thickness of the soft tissue. So those are not contraindications, but attention points for technique selection. I'm going to use biomaterial, I'm going to use connective tissue graft, and as I had in um, as I had in Monica's case, infection, I'm going to prescribe antibiotics for my patient so I can have now a chronic infection and I'm going to extract the tooth, I'm going to clean very well, and I can go through the immediate implant and the literature show that this is very safe 
uh, for our patients. So I have the implant, uh, the immediate implant uh, indications for uh, Monica's case. So now it's time to select the shape of our patients because the patient came for us to do uh, aesthetic rehabilitation. So now I need to select the smile, I need to select the shapes, the teeth format, so I can plan the implant according with this uh, rehabilitation, according with the final shapes. So now it's time to do a mock-up. Now it's time to test the new smile of my patient, and the patient needs to say yes for this new smile. Then I start to plan the implant position according with this new shape. So I need to do now my mock-up. So how can I select? How can I select the best shape? How can I select to my patient the shape for uh, her treatment? What we usually do in the analog way. I mean, I think 95, 98% of the dentists around the world, we use uh, the analog, uh, the analog uh, workflow. So we take an impression of the patient, we send to the lab. When we send to the lab, the lab uh, gives us uh, a wax up. We just try to put uh, some notes. But when the smile comes, the wax up comes, we do like a silicone K, we do a piece of cream, uh, wax, uh, we put a piece of acrylic, uh, um, acrylic composite, and then we do the mock-up. So at the end, this is just uh, the format that the technician decided uh, for our case. And if the patient doesn't like, we need to remove this test drive from the mouth, we need to ask again some modifications to our technician and we lose one appointment. And this is very normal. Uh, so, prosthetically speaking, what is the biggest advantage of uh, the digital workflow um, in dentistry? It's the, when you go through the, the, the softwares and you use the libraries of natural shapes which is really amazing. So we can go inside the softwares, we can select shapes from a natural donator or a natural shapes, and we do a digital mock-up, we print the model, and then we go and do our mock-up. But this is again the same problem, because when you select the shape inside the computer, you have the same problem. How do you select the shapes for the patient? We can try to see the face of the patient. We try to see the format of, uh, of the, the, the face of the patient, the canines. It's really not easy to put the mock-up inside the mouth and the patient say, like, yes, in the first appointment. Thinking about this, uh, I learned from Florin how to use artificial intelligence to use the software, use the artificial intelligence to select the best shape for our patient. And Florin uh, created one very nice uh, software called SmileCloud. SmileCloud is a software that you use from the internet, smilecloud.com. You take the pictures of the patient, you put inside the smile cloud and the software by using artificial intelligence will read the soft tissue uh, format and will search for the best um, shape for your patient. And you can show to this patient before printing the model. So this is very good to avoid this uh, these scenarios that you your patient uh, didn't like the, um, the, the mock-up and then you need to go back again to the lab. So when your patient say yes to the picture, you show to your patient the picture, you show to your patient the future smile, and then when the patient say yes, I like the format, you just download the shapes, 
you go inside a software like Exocad or Treat Shape Dental System, and you then put on top of your patient, you print the model and you do your mock-up. So this is very nice. We are using a lot in our patients and it's working very good. It's available. It's just go smilecloud.com and this is a really um, nice thing to do. So that's it's what we did in Monica's case. We did the mock-up using the Smile Cloud. Uh, we print the model, we did the mock-up, and then Monica uh, said yes to our shapes, and we decided to move on uh, and decide the implant position according with this uh, mock-up. So now it's time for the step number two, which is plan the implant according with this uh, final restoration. What we usually do in that analog way, extract the tooth and we place the implant uh, with a free hand. And what is the measurements that we need to follow? We always need to be at least 1.5 millimeter away from the natural teeth. I mean, measal to distal direction. This is very important. If we place a very wide implant and we uh, we don't have uh, less. Uh, we don't have at least 1.5 millimeters from the the implant to the natural teeth. We can have problems in the interprosumal bone. We can lose papilla, and this is not going to be good in aesthetic zone. So at least 1.5 millimeters away from the natural teeth, from buccal to palatal direction. We need to create a gap at least two millimeters. The best gap we can leave is three millimeters from the implant to the buccal wall. So three millimeter will be very important. And I'm gonna explain a little bit after why this gap is so important. But we need we need to create this gap uh, instead of create um, uh, in order to create uh, a gap to fill this with biomaterial and to create a rigid support for the soft tissue. We're gonna understand a little bit uh, uh, later about this. And um, epical to coronal direction, we need to place our implant at least three to four millimeters away from the future gingival margin. That's why it's very important to understand the final shape for your uh, final restoration so we can plan the implant position. And of course, when you do this in the analog way, freehand, we have an alveolus and we need to place the implant in the perfect position. So this is not easy to do. That's why I like very much to use the digital workflow. And we are using more and more uh, the M software and the AMI guide from MIS, which is in my opinion, the best uh, guided surgery surgery I use in, uh, uh, in the office. It's uh, really good, it's easy, it's predictable, and it's very simple. So what do we need to do these guided surgeries? We need to ask for your patient two exams. First one, a tomography. So I need the DICON file, and then I need the STL. The STL will be a scan from your patient or an impression and then we send this model to the lab and the lab will do the scan of the model. So we need the STL, the initial STL, the DICON file from the tomography. And if you have a walks up, if you have a, um, a smile planted in the software or if you have a, a test drive in the mouth of the patient, we also need this uh, walks up uh, STL. So you can superimpose the image and plan the implant according with your final restoration. So you send both exams to the M center using with transfer or Dropbox, and then they will share screen with you and you plan the implant uh, in a very safe and easy way. So now what is very good about uh, M software is that you superpose the STL from your patient, which is the scan and the tomography. And you're going to plan the perfect position of your implant, not only inside the bone, but also for your final restoration. 
It's very simple. It's very easy. It's very predictable. And then MIS will send you uh, the guide and it's uh, really nice uh, to use. So we did this with MIS. We did this with Lewis in Israel, a uh, very good friend of us, a uh, very good uh, guy, very uh, intelligent guy. So it's uh, very good to plan with Lewis. Uh, we plan this guide and then when the guide arrives in our office, we go for the step number three, which is the extraction and trying to use a minimal invasive approach. So when you use forceps, it's very important to use round movements so you don't damage the buccal wall. So you do round movements to extract the tooth in a very gentle way. This is very important to take care of the tissue in order to Try as much as you can not to damage the papilla, the soft tissue, and also the buccal wall, which is, in my case, a very thin buccal wall. So we extract Monica's uh, central, we clean very well, and then we move to the implant uh, placement. Sometimes we don't have a very good um, tooth to take and do these round movements with your forceps. So there are many devices in the market to extract the tooth in a very gentle way. So we can use a Benex device, you can use a similar uh, of a Benex device to extract this tooth in a very gentle way because when you don't have uh, room enough to take your root with the forceps, it's really not easy to extract a tooth in a minimal invasive way. So by using this device, it's very easy to do a vertical force uh, on top of your tooth and then you extract in a very gentle way. But this is the most important thing. Try to extract in a minimal invasive way. Then we go to the implant uh, placement uh, process. And all the time, try to avoid as much as you can opening flaps. I'm not saying that when you do guided surgery, you need to be uh, flapless all the time. It's not uh, the same. If I do guided surgery, I don't open the flap because I'm not saying the same thing. Opening the flap is not about being guided or not being guided. Opening the flap is about uh, the soft tissue procedures that you need to do, the graft that you need to, to, to perform. So it's uh, about other things, not only about a flapless surgery, but of course, not only about a guided surgery, but of course, when you are guided, it's easier not to open the flap because you are guided uh, by a very nice guide, which is this guided surgery from MIS. You can have a very good visual control. You can drill in a very safe way. You can have uh, in this guide, very nice uh, checkpoints that you understand that the guide is very stable and you just take the drills and you follow the rules from the kit and you drill your implant in a very safe uh, way. This guide is very nice because you don't have this, those spoons that we have in, the very, uh, in different guided systems. So you just need to hold the guide with your hand, make sure that everything is stable, and then you drill in a very safe way. So by using this guide, we drill the implant in the correct position, and also you place the implant with the guide because uh, it's not correct to drill your implant, to drill uh, the implant position, and then you remove the guide to place the implant uh, with a free hand. No, you have a system that allows you to place the implant also guided in a very safe way, in a very good way, and we finish the implant position for Monica's case by using a V3, 3.9 per 13. Very good, very safe with the guided surgery. So now it's time to move on for the step number six, which is the aesthetic tissue reconstruction. This step is very important and we need to do in all of all of our cases. Very important step 
to have uh, predictability in the long term. Why is very important to do the aesthetic tissue reconstruction? Because we need to understand that after distraction, uh, some changes will happen in our patient. We're gonna change the gingival architecture. Let's use this paper to understand this. This is a very important paper in the literature, a very nice paper from a Brazilian uh, uh, dentist, Januário, from 2011. And he did a very nice study. He measured the poco wall thickness in different groups. Uh, let's take the central here, uh, because we are talking in Monica's case. And he saw as a conclusion that the poco wall, the thickness of the poco wall in the middle and in the coronal third of the centrals that the patient that he studied was uh, the measurement was like 86 millimeters. 86% uh, of the patients had only one millimeter of poco wall in the middle and the coronal third, just one millimeter, maximum one millimeter. And 48% of these patients had just 0 0.5 or less than 0 0.5. It's very thin. And my patient, Monica, see, it, it's inside this group. So let's keep this data. Every time when you extract the tooth, the tooth comes with the periodontal ligament. The periodontal ligament will support a very important structure, which is the alveolar bone. The alveolar bone is periodontal ligament dependent. So every time that you extract the tooth, in 100% of the cases, we're going to lose the alveolar bone. So it's very important now to do something to compensate and to minimize this. Because when you extract the tooth, the alveolar bone will be gone because we don't have the periodontal ligament anymore. And if you have a very thin book of bone, as we saw from the from John Waters paper, 0 0.5 in around 48% of our patients, we're gonna lose the rigid support for the soft tissue. It's the buccal wall. After the extraction, we're gonna lose the buccal wall. And we're going to start to have uh, problems with recession. We're going to start to have problems with your implant shining through the gingiva. So that's why it's very important to place a narrow platform implant to create a 3 millimeter gap between the implant and the buccal wall and to pack and to place the biomaterial between the implant and the buccal wall. We cannot preserve the resorption of the distraction but we can compensate and minimize the bone resorption's effect, uh, which is uh, very nice to do with the uh, MIS implant, the Vitri. So I have a triangular neck. I can leave uh, the, 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 the neck of the implant. Um, I, can do a, I can create a better gap. I can create more space with this implant because the head is uh, smaller than the body. So I create this gap very easy, and I pack biomaterial between the implant and the buccal wall, which this, by using uh, this biomaterial, we compensate and minimize the bone resorption's effect. And also, we always gonna use connective tissue graft. This is very important, and we use in 100% of our case. Let's understand why it's so important to use connective tissue graft. Let's take this paper from Link Vicious, a very important dentist from Lithuania. He published in 2015 this amazing paper. And he compared two different groups. The first group, implants, places surrounded by thin tissue. The second group, implant places surrounded by thick tissue. And he saw as a conclusion that when you have thin tissue around your implant, you can use more bone compared when you have thick tissue around implants. The conclusion of Link Vicious paper is initial tissue, initial tissue thickness can influence in crystal bone changes around the implant. So it's very important to have the stability of your bone around the implants with a very thick soft tissue. So we need more than two millimeters 
to have a stability of the bone around the implants. And not only for tissue stability, not only for the bone instability around the implant, but also for aesthetics. This is a very nice paper from 2007. This paper compared the color of the tissue around the natural teeth and the color of the tissue around a restorative material, like an abutment. Zirconia, zirconia with ceramic and metal. And he saw that when you have less than two millimeter thickness of soft tissue, the color of the tissue, even if you use uh, zirconia or ceramic, was always different compared with the natural tooth. So it's very important to have a thick tissue, to have also a very good aesthetics, because if you have less than two millimeters and you use a zirconia or use a zirconia with ceramic, or use a metal abutment, you're gonna have influence in color. You're gonna have a different uh, tissue color around your restorative material. But when you have more than two millimeters, no color change was detectable by the human eyes. You don't have difference comparing with the natural tooth, the, the color of the natural tooth, the color of the soft tissue around the natural tooth. So in order to have long-term stability of the bone and the soft tissue, prevent recession, and to guarantee the aesthetic result, we need to have a tissue with more than two millimeter thickness. That's why it's very important to use connective tissue graft, so we can create stability. The biomaterial will be there to create the rigid support for the soft tissue, and the thickness of the soft tissue with more than two millimeter will guarantee stability and uh, aesthetics for your case. So when you talk about uh, soft tissue, we need to understand the palatal area. So which kind of graft or technique should I use? Because when you go to the palate, you're gonna see that we can have different kind of uh, soft tissue in different techniques uh, described in the literature. And the behavior of this uh, uh, soft tissue will be different so let's understand a little bit about the palatal anatomy so we understand the best technique uh, for the implants in aesthetic zone. The superficial part is the epithelium. We don't use the epithelium in aesthetic zone because we're going to change the color of the tissue. Below the superficial part, below the epithelium, we have the lamina propria, which is the connective, the, the fibrous connective tissue. This tissue is very stable, and this is the tissue that we want in our connective tissue grafts. Below the lamina propria, we have the submucosa, which is the adipose tissue, the glandular tissue, the tissue that is not very stable. We try to avoid as much as we can to remove this uh, part of the palate because the quality of the tissue is not so good. Then we have the periosteum and then we have the bone. If you remove a graft, uh, a free gingival graft, you're gonna see exactly like this. You're going to have the superficial part of the telium, lamina propria, and submucosa. And as much as we go to the anterior part of the palate, you're going to have more fat. We're going to have more adipose tissue. You're going to have less vascularity. This is less stable, and we have less fiber. So this is uh, not the best tissue that we can uh, remove from the palate. When you go to the posterior part of the palate, we have less adipose tissue, have more vascularity, this is more stable, and we have more fibers. So this is the graph that we want because it's more stable. So let's understand the techniques. And let's talk a little bit about the linear technique, a very common technique described in the literature. And it's the technique that you remove the medium part of the palate, not the superficial, not the posterior part of the palate, not the, 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 the part of the palate that is close to the bone. You remove the medium part of your palate. This is a technique very common in the literature. You just take a 15C blade and you separate the connective tissue graft from the epithelium. Then with the same blade, we start to separate the connective tissue graft from the periosteum and we try as much as you can to do everything with blade with the use periodontal elevators. 
with two vertical incisions, one distal and one mesial, and one horizontal incision, you remove uh, the graft, and it's a very safe uh, and easy technique. This is normally the graft we have in the linear technique. As we are removing the middle part of the pelt, we gonna leave some lamina propria with the, with the epithelium, and we're gonna leave some periosteum uh, to protect the bone. So we're gonna remove, if you go to the anterior part, more fat, we're gonna remove some part of uh, glandular tissue, which is, uh, which is a little bit not so stable. So uh, this is a technique that sometimes we don't have a very stable result in the long term. So that's why we try as much as we can to go to the posterior area and try to use the same technique, but in the posterior area. Because in the posterior area, we're going to have a very good tissue quality. We have a lot of uh, fibrous tissue. We, not, we don't have in the posterior area adipose tissue or glandular tissue. So you can remove a very good tissue and a very stable tissue. This is a video uh, from Eric Van Doren uh, in Antwerp, our master. We are together uh, at that time. So we are now removing the tissue from the tuberosity. And as you can see here in the video, it's a very fibrous tissue and very stable for our, our receiving site. Uh, when you have a very good uh, tuberosity, you're going to have a situation like this. The only problem and the only thing that we really need to understand is that when you take a tissue from the tuberosity and when you take more than three millimeter thickness of tissue from the tuberosity, you can have hyperplastic response in time. So after months or after years, you can see uh, maybe uh, hyperplastic classic uh, sign all you can see a tissue starting to grow and grow a little bit and maybe sometimes too fibrous sometimes the tissue looks a little bit white because the tissue is too fibrous so uh, in order to prevent a bad quality of tissue or in order to prevent an hyperplastic response we are now using more and more the free gingival graft technique and we remove the epithelium, which is the tiptalized free gingival graft described by Zucchelli. This is a very good technique because we remove the superficial part of the palate, we remove the lamina propria and also the epithelium. And when you remove the epithelium outside of the mouth or inside the mouth with a purse, you're gonna have the best quality of. Uh, of uh, connective tissue graft. So what we usually do, we take a 15 C blade, we design in the palate exactly the size of the soft tissue that we want. You take a wide, round diamond burr, you remove the epithelium inside the mouth. This is uh, something that I really like to use. This is something that I really like to do. When I remove the epithelium uh, inside the mouth, I'm gonna see blood, I'm going to see bleeding, and then I know that I am in the connective tissue. I just remove the lamina propria, and I keep uh, in the palate, I keep there the submucosa. The submucosa will protect the patient. The patient will have a better healing, the patient will have a very comfortable healing, and I will do some sutures just to have a better hemostasia, just to have a better uh, bleaching uh, bleeding control. I'm gonna use now uh, collagen membrane just to protect the patient and to organize the coagulum and I'm gonna have a very good healing for the patient. And we know from this uh, technique and also for from this paper from 2015 in the Journal of uh, Periodontology, when you remove the soft tissue from the palate, the superficial part is uh, the best for tissue quality and also for patient uh, comfort, for the healing comfort. Uh, when you remove 
the deepest part of the palate, when you go in the deepest part of the palate, this will be the most painful for the patient. So that's why you don't remove the deepest part of the palate because you're gonna have first a uh, very painful healing for the patient. Second, you're gonna have a uh, uh, very bad tissue quality because as deep as you go, more glandular tissue and adipose tissue. And of course, when you go deep in the palate, you are closer to the artery. So my advice, use the techniques to remove the superficial part of the palate. You're gonna have better tissue quality, comfort for your patient, and also you will avoid more and more uh, uh, problems with, um, uh, with uh, cutting the artery, which will be safe for you in your procedures. So this is what we did in Monica's case. Let's go back to Monica's case. We placed the implant in the palatal direction using the NGUI system. We use the biomaterial in the buccal wall. We fill the gap. We pack the biomaterial in the buccal wall between the implant and the buccal wall. And we create an envelope. You create a tunnel with a microblade for your connective tissue graft. So we are now respecting the step number four, which is doing a minimal invasive approach. So we are using now microblades to create this envelope, to create this uh, tunnel, and we take this graft from the deeptalized fringe, free gingival uh, graft technique, and we are using now monofilament sutures to suture the graft in position between the soft tissue and the buccal wall to increase the soft tissue thickness and to create a very good aesthetic result and also a stability for your case. So we place the cover screw and we use the biomaterial to fill the gap between the implant and the buccal wall. As you can see here, all the tissue reconstruction is done. So now it's time to move on for the step number seven, which is the provisional crown design. This is a very important step now because now it's time to have a very good support for the soft tissue. And what we do in the transition, traditional way, we take a titanium cylinder, we can use some opaque to have a better color. We just put in a screw in the mouth. You take an x-ray to see if everything's okay. And then we try to use an old crown or try to create a a good provisional doing under contours and these kind of things. But the problem with this is you are trying to do the images profile with your head. And what I learned from Victor is that when you strike a tooth, you have different tooth sections. We can have an oval tooth, you can have a triangular tooth, you can have a trapezoidal tooth, you can have a square tooth. And you need to support the tissue in the correct way. Because when you know, don't support the soft tissue in the correct way, you can have tissue shrinkage. You can have a problem with tissue shrinkage. And you can uh, create a problem with your tissue design. And after that, you will need to unscrew your implant. You need to add some flow composite or you need to send to the lab. And you start to create a problem disconnecting, connecting all the time. So by thinking this, uh, my grandmaster, Eric van Doren, decided to try to copy nature in the analog way. And he published in 2016 a very nice paper, which is the analog protocol, the analog model to create, to create uh, the best emergence profile by copying the nature. Uh, so what we need to do now, we need to copy the critical comp. We need to copy uh, this uh, first millimeter between uh, uh, this first millimeter subgingival. This first millimeter subgingival is the critical contour. And this we need to support in a very good way and try to copy as much as you can the root of the patient. After that, or below the subcritical, the, the critical contour, we have the subcritical contour. There, we need to create this uh, under contour. We need to do this subcontour 
so you can create space for the soft tissue for the biomaterial and then you're gonna have a very good final result you're gonna increase the volume and we're gonna support the tissue in the perfect way so let's understand how Eric described this so the first thing you need to do when you uh, go for distraction is to take an impression a silicone impression then you just remove the tooth and you're gonna have the tooth and the model you're gonna put the tooth inside the model and you're gonna give to your technician to pour the model you're gonna have exactly the same situation you have uh, before extraction in the mouth so when the technicians remove the tooth inside the mouth you're gonna have the same situation that we have in the mouth you're gonna have the critical contour you're gonna have the tooth section so this will be perfect for the provisional and the lab will create the best support for the tissue what we need to do now we need to place the implant in the correct 3d position and then we need to transfer this implant position to the model so we are now putting uh uh, impression copying we take a we take a, a silicone key we do a, a, a Duralay key and we use uh, the the incisal edge position of the, the, the adjacent teeth to have a fixed uh, a rigid support and we flowable composite with Duralay we just capture this uh, implant uh, copying we remove from the mouth we just clean very well and we can add some uh, uh, composite to make sure that everything is very rigid you give this to your technician they will screw uh, uh, the this uh, this uh, impression copying in the inside the analog and they will put everything inside the alveolar model. So by doing this, they will have the same position of my implant inside the mouth, and they will have the tooth section, the first millimeter. By doing this, creating the best emergence profile will be easy. We're gonna use uh, the provisional titanium cylinder, uh, and the, this uh, titanium cylinder, uh, they come, uh, anodizing in yellow so it's very good we don't need to use opaque it's very good for the tissue color we are using the 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 the, the, the natural crown of the patient and by using uh, composite or or uh, flowable composite we just gonna capture this uh, titanium cylinder and then we create the images profile copying the uh, alveolar uh, model copying the natural format of the tooth so this is very nice this is very easy but takes a lot of time and you need a technician uh, by your side so this is the analog way which is very intelligent and works very well then we decided to move on to the same technique but now Go into the digital world. So that is what it did in uh, Monica's case. So after doing the implant and the soft tissue, we take a scan and we scan our implant. We take this uh, scan post, we scan the implant, and then we need now the tooth information. And the tooth we will find inside the CBCT. So what the technician will do, he will take the CBCT he will put the CBCT inside the software called Invesalius to transform the CBCT in a STL, and then he will import this STL to the ExoCAD, and we will have the impression from my implant inside the mouth, and then he will take the tooth from the tomography, and he will superimpose those images to copy the first millimeter, to copy the critical contour. So we are using now the tooth 21, which is the adjacent teeth, to copy perfectly the tooth, uh, uh, the, 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 the other central that we want to copy. We need to create similar restorations uh, of the two centers. So look at the image. We have exactly the same 
format of the tooth, 21, and we just mirror this to the tooth 11. Not only in this buccal view, but also from the occlusal view. So now we're going to support the tissue in a very good way. We're going to support the tissue in the best way to have a very good emergence profile and healing for the tissue. So after one hour, one hour and 30 minutes, our lab in Dentkov will deliver the restoration. They will meal in PMMA and we're going to just screw inside the mouth of Monica's case. Very easy, copy in the nature and works very well. But if you don't have a scanner or a milling machine in your office, you're going to do exactly the same. You're going to take the Tycon file, you're going to take the STL, you send to the lab, and you're going to do this before the surgery. The lab will superimpose those images again, CBCT inside the Invisalis software, transform in STL, then go to the ExoCAD and superimpose the STL from the tomography and the STL from uh your models. They will remove the tooth inside the model and then they will copy the tooth and copy the first millimeter of the root. By doing this, all the work will be done and you're going to get this provisional from your lab with a very good critical contour. And very important tip, ask for your lab to do those wings so you can know exactly the perfect position to capture your provisional cylinder inside the mount. So let me use this as an example, just removing the tooth, placing a V3 guided again, putting a provisional cylinder inside the mount, and then I just take this PMMA provisional, I put inside the mount, and with flowable composite, I just gonna do my uh, immediate provisional. I just add some more flowable composite in the subcritical contour. I will do a subcontour. I cut the wings and then I have the perfect provisional. So this is very easy, very predictable, and we are doing more and more and more in our cases. Copying the nature by using the digital flow of copying the natural tooth. So let's go back to Monica's case. After we finish the surgery, we need to wait always third, um, three months, always 90 days. This is very important for the soft tissue, not only for this OS integration, but for the soft tissue, we need to wait at least three months so we have a situation like this. And you see that the soft tissue looks very good because we are supporting the tissue in the perfect way. We are using the tooth 21, we are mirroring this tooth 21, to the to the 11 and you're going to have the same uh, soft tissue format. After that, Florin will put the mock-up to prep and to scan our implant and also the natural teeth to do our final restoration. But look, now the quality of the soft tissue around the V3 implant, how uh, clean is the system, how um, uh, how safe is to use this system? Because when you use a PMMA, when you use a very good implant system, guided surgery, you create soft tissue, this is very stable. This is very uh, safe in the long term. So we prepped the teeth, we did the scan, and then we moved to the step number eight, eight which is the abutment design. And then we are not now trying to copy what we did with the provisional. I don't need to scan the soft tissue. I'm going to use exactly the same technique as using the provisional, copying the tooth. We are just now again superimposing the images, taking the tooth 21 and copy again the, the, the first millimeter, the critical contour. We're going to copy this uh, critical contour and create this under contour, this sub contour to allow the tissue to stay uh, very thick. So we are now doing our final restoration and as you can see here we are now copying exactly the natural teeth and the section of the natural teeth which is very important to support the tissue. Doing in the digital way 
what Eric published in 2016 in the analog way. And we are now using a very nice, uh, very nice uh, screwdriver, a very nice screw from MIS, which is the easy abutment. So we plan the implant inside the bone, but we plan in the incisal direction. If we try to do a screw retain restoration, it will not be possible. But when you work with a system like <coughs> MIS, you have this easy abutment and you can plan the implant in the incisal direction. And you know that you're going to use the easy abutment to change the position of your screw. And you can change up to 20 degrees. So you can plan like this, place your implant perfect inside the bone. And then you just use the easy abutment to correct the angulation. Because sometimes you have this kind of situations. And it's not possible to place the implant in the palatal direction and have a very good uh, um, screw retain restoration. So look at uh, restoration, Monica's restoration. We have an implant a little bit buckle, but by using the easy abutment, you can have a screw retain, retain restoration in a very safe uh, way. So those are all the... Those are all the, the restoration, milled. Those are all the restoration milled uh, in ceramic. Uh, we stain everything in dent cough. Very nice. And now it's time to put inside the mouth and create the final restoration uh, uh, with our ceramics. So now it's time for the step number nine, which is screwing in the final restoration and try and must as much as you can to avoid these connections. So now it's time to put the final restoration and do the best job to screw inside the mouth and try as much as you can not to unscrew, screw, unscrew the restoration so we cannot we don't create inflammation. So look when you copy again the root you don't have any surprises now. You don't have any problems now because we are now using exactly the same as used in our provisional. So we don't have any pressure now. We have exactly the same as we had in our provisional. So look at the quality of soft tissue now. And we are now trying the restoration. We are now trying the ceramics. And look, when you put the final restoration, you have exactly the same format of our provisional. Very important, very safe, and then we go for the bonding process. The bonding process will be under the rubber dump, so you can have a better situation for cleaning, you can have a safe situation for cementation, and you see the fit of the monolithic restorations after cementations, and let's see a video how we did the cementation. So now, using the rubber dump, using the isolation, we clean the prep by using uh, aqua care. After cleaning the prep, you we use uh, 15 seconds of uh, etching, phosphoric acid. We etch for 15 seconds. We clean very well. After that, we use the bone. And by using the rubber done, it's very easy to clean very well. It's very easy to be safe uh, in your bonding process. So by using the cement now, we're going to cement the final restoration and we're going to clean very well. We're going to clean very well by using 12 D blades, by using rubbers. It's very safe and you can work in a very... Uh, safe um, cementation. This is OxyGuard, just to have a very good uh, polymerization and cleaning the, the, the cement excess. So by using the rubbers, we are removing the excess of cement and we go step by step cementing our final restoration. Now it's time to remove the rubber dump and to have uh, our final implant restoration torque it inside the mouth. When you use the easy abutment, the abutment we, that we use from MIS, you cannot 
torque more than 20 newtons. So 20 newtons of torque, and then you finish your restoration. This is immediate post-op, very nice uh, feel. Of course, some inflammation. Then we can just leave the tissue some months. will look very good, will look very healthy, and after a year, the tissue will be very good because you are supporting by using the natural form. You are supporting copy the, the, the nature, copying the natural truth. And of course, placing the implant in the correct reposition, creating stability with the tissue, placing the implant in the palatal direction, using the filling material to, uh, to pack between the implant and the buccal wall and support the tissue in a very good way, avoiding disconnect all the time, you can create a very predictable restoration. And you can look in different views, a very nice restoration. You can have a very good emergence profile by copying the nature. This is a front view of Monica's case. She looks very happy. The tooth, uh, it's really close to the natural uh, tooth and looks very good and the patient is very happy. So now it's the initial uh, CBCT. After placing the implant in 90 days, you see the implant in the correct reposition by using the end guide, the biomaterial, the quality of soft tissue, and after one year, this looks very stable. When you use the V3, the bone around the implant is very stable. When you use connective tissue graft, everything looks very stable. And as you can see here in the tomography, we have everything that we discussed. Implant in the correct reposition. Buccal bone to uh, protect the implant and to create, to have a rigid support for the soft tissue. Soft tissue thickness of more than 2 millimeters. We have here more than 3 millimeters. So this is very stable. With this, the literature and also our clinical experience shows that this is very stable. So we are using this as a protocol in all of our cases. I can stay here showing the initial cases and final case, but the protocol is the same. We are doing exactly the same in our cases because by just respecting these steps, we can create very easy and predictable uh, restoration. Combining the digital tools, using a very good implant like P3 and a guided surgery, and of course, respecting the biological concepts uh, for our, our restoration. So I think I had a little bit more than one hour. So this is my email. You can email me uh, every time you want. Uh, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure to be here. I think now I move to some questions uh, so we can discuss a little bit. I have a question from Argentina if there is uh, any digital way to reproduce the Van Duren technique. As I said, yes, we are using the CBCT uh, by copying the root format and going inside the software, just transforming this CBCT in an STL. So I just uh, explained in Monica's case. Uh, so it's uh, very nice. Does it really mean Yes, uh, we have the scan post in the V3. This is a very nice kit from MIS. We can uh, use in the standard and also narrow. And you just screw in and you scan. And all the libraries from MIS are inside the, the, the design software. Would I see the same protocol for posterior teeth? So, yes, for posterior teeth, we are using the same protocol. The only difference. The only difference that we use in the posterior is that sometimes you don't use uh, this protocol with immediate loading. We use exactly the same protocol, but we use uh, a healing abutment, um, a customized healing abutment. We do exactly the same protocol. We strike the tooth, we place the implant guided, we try to use the septum, we do the biomaterial, we use connective tissue graft, we scan the implant, 
where you go for the software, we take the molar, let's say a molar, from the CBCT, and we do a customized healing abutment. Because most of the times I'm not a comfort, uh, comfortable, it's not a comfortable situation to have a, a immediate loading in a posterior area. So we do a customized healing abutment. It's the same as we have like a, a crown, but we just cut in the gingival line. So the tissue will be supported in a very good way. And after three months, you just unscrew and do the final restoration. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I saw in Lisbon question about buccal bone. This is the ideal extraction CBCT bone graft. What is the buccal bone is fusing in the root or it just come and you don't have a buccal a bone? Uh, yes, uh, we do exactly the same protocol. If you lose like the full buccal bone, you just do exactly the same um, the same protocol and we pack biomaterial with some collagen uh, inside. We try to use uh, the, 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 the bios collagen and we just pack there because it's more stable. And if you lose all the buccal wall, maybe it's time to use like a small membrane to keep everything in position. And then you do connective tissue graft and you do exactly the same. But I use exactly the same protocol if I lose all the buccal bone. A very good, uh, a nice technique for this also is the IDR, which is the immediate uh, dental ovular restoration. Uh, described by José Carlos Rosa, a dentist from Brazil. Uh, you do exactly, exactly the same protocol, but instead of using connective tissue graft and biomaterial, you remove a uh, bone from the tuberosity, a cortical medullar bone from the, the, the tuberosity, and you just put to uh, reconstruct the Boca wall. Two different options that works very well. Question. Filling vestibular gap after immediate implant with autogen bone could be beneficial. Depends. If you do just a uh, autogenous bone uh, and you do this, uh, you smash the, the, the autogenous bone, this is not stable as the particular biomaterial. Uh, when you use like biomaterial, this is more stable in the long term. But when you use autogenous bone, as I said, from the IDR technique, when you use a cortical medullar bone from the tuberosity, like a, um, like a bone block graft, this is very stable. And Jose Carlos Rosa is showing a lot of uh, very good results with this kind of autogenous bone. But it needs to be like a block. Okay. What about long-term prognosis? Do you expect gum reception? No. If I do this protocol, I don't expect gum reception. If I don't use the biomaterial and if I don't use the connective tissue graft with a very good emergence profile from your restoration, you can expect some recession. But uh, when you don't have this uh, kind of graft, maybe you can have problems in the long term. But what the literature shows and what we have in our experience, when you use a connective tissue graft, when you have more than two millimeters, when you have the biomaterial there, when you have the implant in the correct position, and you have a good, uh, a good emergence profile to support everything, and you don't push the tissue in the horizontal direction, you don't expect a recession. This really uh, safe for our patients, but you need to respect the protocol. If you don't respect and you lose like one or two steps, you can have recessions in a short and medium or long uh, term uh, of your case. What else? Do you decide to use multi-unity or trans epithelial versus direct? Yes, I'm using now more and more. Uh, I'm using trying to use more and more the connect. The connect is a very good uh, tool from MIS, a very good component uh, to try to use as much as you can the concept one about one one time. So we are now trying as much as you can not to 
unscrew and screw all the time. So by using the connect, which is a very nice uh, component that you screw at the same day of your uh, implant placement, you put the implant subcrestal, you put um, the connect, you torque it. We have a very good, uh, a very good bone stability with this. And then on top of the connect, you try to create. I don't have more than um, six to six months to one year of experience. But I'm seeing and checking very nice results. And as I see from Nitsa Bichacho, from Victor Clavijo, from Eric Van Doren, uh, it looks very, very good. Also, Linke Vicious is showing a lot of uh, good results with Connect. So I think this is a very good uh, and intelligent and smart decision to do. Thank you very much, Dr. Gustavo, for such a new experience. A very good result with Dr. Farr. Thank you so much. My pleasure. For soft tissue conditioning in case of a lathe implant uh, placement in Tiro, can I adopt the idea of uh, replicating the first millimeters of the root form? Yes, of course, for sure. No doubt. Very good. Thank you. It was a pleasure to listen. you. Greetings for Spain. My pleasure, my friend. Uh, what else? Long time. I think that's it, right? My friends, it was a pleasure to be here. I hope I can see you all in a different Congress. Thank you, MIS, for this amazing invitation. And thank you for creating this amazing and very clever product. So it's a huge pleasure to work with MIS. And it's a huge pleasure to be here. See you uh, in a different time. Bye, my friends.